Hi, I'm Lydia Brown. And I'm Carmen Baskoff, and we're the producers of Where We Live. Before we hear the show, we're taking a moment to remind you that we're in the midst of a fundraising campaign. We appreciate all of our listeners, your comments, your tweets, your show ideas. So if you appreciate the show, consider going online and making a pledge of support today. You can go to wnpr.org slash donate. That's wnpr.org slash donate. And thanks. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Do you ride a bicycle just for fun or to get to work, school, and everywhere in between? Today we learn about the history of bicycles from the Pope Manufacturing Company in Hartford to how these two-wheeled vehicles became a source of empowerment more than a century ago. Coming up, we'll hear about the BC Code program at the Center for Latino Progress. It offers bicycle-centered programs in Hartford to promote youth and adult safety, while also serving the community with initiatives like Bikes for Jobs. BC Code's program manager, Joseph Dickerson, will be here later. We'll also be joined by a couple of historians who will explain how bikes helped fuel the women's rights movement after becoming an important way for people to travel during the late 19th century. Do you bike to work or school? Do you think it's only fit for recreation? Or is it your primary source of transportation? Join our conversation. Email where we live at wmpr.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. I want to welcome to the show uh, Margaret Guroff, author of The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. Margaret's joining us by phone. Welcome to the show, Margaret. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I also want to welcome in studio with us Eileen Frank, Chief Curator and COO of the Connecticut Historical Society. Eileen, welcome to where we live. Thanks for having me. I'll start with you, uh, Margaret. So tell us a little bit about uh, the history, early history of bicycles and what we would consider a bike ancestors that were, I think, most like a scooter. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about what was called a Drazine. This was the first Um, two-wheeler. So it was the first vehicle that had kind of two wheels in a line, the way we know a bicycle today. And these were um, invented in Germany in uh, 1817 and came over here in 1819 um, and enjoyed a very brief fad that summer, including at Yale, where uh, all the students were riding them around. Um, The reason it's an ancestor rather than an actual bicycle is because it didn't have pedals. So the way you would get around on it would be by balancing and sort of kicking off the way you do with a scooter um, in a kind of a Fred Flintstone maneuver. So you'd push off and then glide as far as you could go. You mentioned pedals. So when were they invented? And is there a Connecticut story to that invention? There is indeed. So um, this, like I said, the Drazine, the first uh, bicycle type device kind of went away. It was very heavy and and very, very expensive. when a bicycle first appeared was much later, right after the Civil War, and it was patented in the United States by a French immigrant by the name of Pierre Lalmont, who had come to um, Ansonia from France to work uh, as, in, as a mechanic. And um, there's still a great deal of controversy in France about this story, because at the same time that Lalmont was testing a pedal velocipede, so kind of the same two-wheel device, but with a pedal that on the front axle so that you could uh, churn your way forward without having to touch the ground. The same kind of device was becoming popular in France. So um, Laumont's story was that he had invented it in France, um, brought it here, put it together, uh, tested it, refined it, and patented it here. Um, when he went back to France, there were people riding all over the place with similar devices. So is it because they saw him when he was in France, or was it because he saw them when they were in France? And stories will differ on that. But in any case, um, Ansonia was really the birthplace in the United States of this crank velocipede pedal uh, bicycle. And when they uh, saw him riding, what was the reaction? Uh, They didn't know what was going on. I mean, this was... um, something that went faster than a horse downhill, which nothing had done before. Um, And it it could go without uh, anybody, you know, as I said, no no pushing off, no touching the the ground. So it was really a mystery. And he, um, Lalemont told a story about one of the first times that he rode it um, around near Ansonia, I think, to a place called Derby or Darby at the time. Um, And uh, 
he was going downhill and he couldn't control it and he kind of came up behind a couple of people who didn't know what it was and they kind of took off in terror and he fell off the bike and had to walk it into town and when he got to I guess a, a public house um, to look for a drink these guys were in there saying that they had seen the devil flying down the hill <laughs> and his response was I was that devil now, uh, you mentioned he, so when these bicycles were becoming more uh, popular, uh, this was something that was reserved for men primarily? Well, that, um, that configuration was actually ridden by men and women, in, but for a very brief time, um, around 19, uh, sorry, 1869, there was a fad on both sides of the Atlantic. And that was a, uh, it was very heavy, and it was made a lot, the wood were like, the wheels were like, wagon wheels that were made with wood um, or iron. Um, and women could ride these because they were sort of, you know, low to the ground. What happened in the development of the bicycle almost immediately was that in order for it to go faster, the wheels had to get bigger because they didn't know about um, gears. So the only way to make a racing machine was to be able to make a bigger driving wheel. And so they got bigger and bigger until they were you know, half the length of a grown man's legs. <laughs> and that's how you get these, you know, what we look at as very quaint high wheel bicycles with a little tiny training wheel. Those were racing machines. And those were the ones that women really couldn't ride in uh, the clothing that was required of women to wear. They had voluminous skirts, they had um, corsets to wear, and you just couldn't really get up on one of these things in that kind of clothing. Well, I've seen pictures of these, and we have some of them on our website at wmpr.org slash where we live. These high-wheeled bicycles, I mean, they looked uh, kind of precarious to be perched up there and, and to try uh, to balance on them, Margaret. They were extremely precarious. Um, they uh, one, one thing that happened quite frequently was called doing a header um, because your whole, all your body weight was balanced right over top of the pedals, which were, you know, in the center of this big wheel. And if you hit a little rock or something you would go flying over the top and hit your head. This is where we live. Uh, we're learning about the history of the bicycle. Uh, it's rooted here in the history of Connecticut. On the phone with me, Margaret Guroff, author of The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. And in studio with me is Eileen Frank, chief curator and COO of the Connecticut Historical Society in Hartford. You can join our conversation, too. Are you a biking enthusiast? Do you use your bicycle uh, just for recreation? Do you use it to get to work or to school? We want you to join the conversation as well. Eileen, uh, we heard uh, Margaret mention these high-wheeled bicycles. Mark Twain had one of them. Mark Twain did, and uh, he he um, wrote a really funny essay uh, called Taming the Bicycle, which is the experience of trying to learn how to ride it. He does talk about what Margaret mentioned, doing a header, falling off of it. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty humorous piece, as you would expect from Mark Twain. Um, but what was great is his last line of the of the essay where he says, get a bicycle, you will not regret it if you live. Um, so he had a, a very, as usual, uh, tongue-in-cheek Twainian response to, to the bicycle. But he did um, see its importance in providing uh, transportation for people and that um, as, uh, especially once we get into the 1890s, they were coming down in price and so it became much more affordable. Um, as Margaret mentioned, not only could they be faster than a horse, but then you don't need to feed the horse. <laughs> you know, bicycles don't need uh, hay and oats. And so he, I think he respected the, the, um, the freedom that it provided to anyone who had a bicycle. Uh, Margaret, I mentioned to our listeners that uh, Connecticut has uh, this uh, history of bicycles, uh, primarily in Hartford. Can you tell us about how the city was uh, important to uh, the development of bicycles, including uh, a man by the name of Al Albert Pope, I believe? Yes, um, it was crucial. It really shaped the way that um, bicycle technology and then by extension automobile technology um, came to the United States. Uh, so uh, Albert Pope was he was actually from Massachusetts, but in 1876 he went down to the Philadelphia Exposition, like the World's Fair, and that's where he saw these high wheelers from uh, ex from England, which were at the time they were um, made by craftsmen, one piece at a time. Um, they were very very expensive, but he got the idea of um, making them in a factory and making them with interchangeable parts so that he would have one person making the spokes and they would all be the same size and one person making the, the um, 
uh, you know, the wheels. And so um, when he decided to do that, the first thing he did was uh, rent out a, a sewing machine factory in Hartford. So even though he was originally from Massachusetts, he started this business in Hartford. This uh, became the Pope uh, Manufacturing Company, which made a brand of bicycles called Columbia Bicycles. And these were the first um, mass-produced high-wheel bicycles, and he really took over the market. Um, he uh, bought up all these uh, patents. People had been trying to develop this kind of technology since the beginning of the 19th century, and so um, by the time that he got involved in the 1870s, there were many people with claims and many people with patents, and he just kind of cornered the market. Um, and even though these were still luxury goods, he made them more available and more accessible, and became a market leader in the de further development of the bicycle. Were women becoming more interested in riding these particular bicycles, Margaret? These bicycles uh, could not be ridden by proper women, really, because of the clothing and also because of um, the, the expectations of them. These were, these were, like I said, racing bikes. These were for, um, uh, you know, gentlemen, sportsmen to go out into the world on. Um, and it was not considered proper for women to ride them. What was developed for women instead were tricycles, which look um, very steampunky if you look at the pictures there. Uh, two of these big wheels with a bench in between for the, the rider to sit on, and then a treadle in the front and a little balancing wheel in the front or the back. These were very, very heavy. They were even more expensive than the big wheel bicycles, and they didn't give women the kind, the sensation that men were getting from these bicycles of being able to zoom around, sit high off the ground, see everything, and um, and they, they the women did uh, have a desire for that, but they didn't have access to it. Uh, Eileen uh, Frank is here with uh, from the His Connecticut Historical Society. Uh, you have examples of some of those early Pope bicycles. Uh, can you describe them as well? And uh, um, were they easier to ride? Right. So when so when Pope um, in the 1890s, Pope um, starts making uh, changes that, and they start being called safety bicycles. And so when the wheels become the same size. Um, and they can lower the frame and they can make the frame have um, more of that, not a full U-shape, Margaret might know the term, but it's, an, it's a thing where you can, you know, basically straddle the bike easier. Um, that invention immediately allowed women to ride the bicycle, which they couldn't with the high wheeler. And um, they still needed dress reform um, because... The dresses at the time, you know, they had often they had very tight and high um, collars and sleeves that tapered, um, and they were very constricting. And the skirts were so voluminous in their corsets. So just you know, imagine trying to like step onto a bicycle today in a big skirt is is a is a challenging thing. So um, so once once Pope started making that safety bicycle, and when you see a high wheeler next to an 1890 safety bicycle, all of a sudden you're like, well, one you recognize it as a bike of today. But two, you can just imagine the ease of getting onto that bike, um, and so that was really the revolution for for women. And from a from a, um, a marketing standpoint for Pope and his company, it um, doubled his uh, potential buyer uh, population. So it was it was a great boom for him. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're learning more about the history of bicycles with Eileen Frank, chief curator and COO of the Connecticut Historical Society in Hartford, and author Margaret Guroff. Her book's called The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. Coming up, how did women riding bicycles help set the ground for the women's rights movement? We'll talk more about that after the break, and we'll take your emails too. Find us at where we live at WMPR.org or on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We've been learning about the history of the bicycle with my guest, Eileen Frank, chief curator and COO of the Connecticut Historical Society here in Hartford. And joining us by phone, Margaret Guroff, author of The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. As bicycling became more mainstream, how did it begin to change the lives of women? We heard a little bit from uh, Eileen about uh, how this started a revolution in women's clothing. Margaret, can you add to that? Um, yeah, so so Eileen is absolutely right that women, uh, even though the bikes got lower and the, um, they got this scooped out shape for women so that you could um, step over them, you still had to uh, alter 
what you were wearing. You couldn't wear, I mean, women were wearing uh, dresses and skirts that could weigh 25 pounds. You just can't do that on a bicycle. Um, so they shortened their skirts. Uh, they started wearing um, what were called bloomers, which had actually been um, proposed 50 years earlier and kind of laughed out of the conversation. Um, bloomers are long, sort of flowing pants based on a Turkish style that uh, that uh, wrap up around your knee and get tight so that they would stay out of the way of the wheels. Um, the first women who dressed like this because they wanted to um, experience this freedom of movement that the men were experiencing on their on their high wheelers. They also were mocked, um, but uh, very very quickly over the course of just a few years, it became normal to see women wearing you know exposing their ankles, shock of all shocks, or or wearing these um, blou- kind of blousey pants, these bloomers, um, and that gave women um, not only more autonomy. I mean, before the bicycle. You had to walk everywhere, or if you had a horse and carriage, if you were rich, you had to ask permission from your husband or your or your father um, to use it. But this was a way that women could go wherever they wanted to go, um, and uh, they with lighter weight clothing, without these constraining corsets, they felt stronger in every way, and that began to influence the way they thought about their place in the world. Oh, we mentioned how once the the wheels became lower, uh, they were the bicycles were easier to to ride. But what about the invention of the gear drive as well, Margaret? Uh, did you see a lot more women getting on bicycles once this innovation came about? Yeah, it's so it's it goes hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. The reason that the wheels got big was so that they could go faster, and then the way that the wheels got small again was the invention of the gear drive, so that you could crank the pedals once and make the driving wheel turn more than once. So it's, it has the same power as a big wheel bike without that, that towering um, silhouette. Eileen, uh, the Historical Society has examples of, of, of bicycling outfits. Can you describe what the women's bicycling outfit looked like? Yeah, we have a really great outfit in our collection from around 1895. And um, when you look at it, it, it looks quite plain. It's a, it's a dark gray wool outfit. It's, a, it's actually two pieces that snap together to make a, a uniform. So it has those bloomers that Margaret was mentioning, those very um, voluminous pant-like uh, outfit. But they're, they're high. You can see on, on the mannequin, you can see how they're high. And the ankle is definitely exposed. The top has a, a sailor's um, collar, so you don't have that restrictive neck. Uh, the the leaves are nice and loose. When you look at it, you're like, oh, a person wearing that, a woman wearing that can definitely move, raise her arms up and down, move all of her joints and limbs. And, uh, and even though this was a a pretty radical version of a woman's bicycling outfit. You can you can see the difference when you look at like what was high fashion in the ladies' magazines versus this um, outfit. And uh, I, there's a really great article in, in the Hartford Current from May 4th, 1894, and the title is "Bicycle Bloomers." And the um, the journalist writes: Some said no Winstead woman would dare appear in them, but they were mistaken. They came with the spring, and they are fearfully and wonderfully made. A Winstead woman bicyclist has at last appeared in bloomers. This woman who enjoys this unusual distinction is Mrs. F.B. Catlin. And it goes on to describe how the family goes out bike riding with dad and mom and baby in tow. um, And that Mrs. Catlin is now going to start the women of Winstead wearing bloomers. And, you know, you think about how she's probably just some random woman in town, you know, middle class woman. She's not a celebrity. Not like today where we like write about all the celebrities, what they're wearing. It's just, you know, if I was walking down the street and something strange, it made... The news. It made the newspaper that it was such this radical thing to see a woman wearing this split pant outfit and their ankles exposed. It was quite, quite extreme for the society. So again, we're talking about the late 1800s. I mean, how how quickly did we see this shift in public perception, Eileen, where uh, you know the fact that they were exposing their ankle, ankles was scandalous at one point, and then once these outfits started to be developed, I mean, how soon did people start to say, oh, that's more agreeable, and you didn't see that uproar? 
Yeah, so it happens fairly quickly. Um, I mean, there was always going to be an uproar to women wearing pants in the 1890s. I mean, that was not accepted that you could wear trousers. But, um, you know, two years later, the Hartford Current runs an article where they are um, quoting from Scribner's Magazine, which was a very popular magazine at the time. And um, the writer says, within two years, bicycle riding has given to all American womankind the liberty of dress for which the reformers have been sighing for for generations. Um, And that goes back to the bloomer was invented in the 1840s. Here we are the 1890s before it's first being adopted. And it's because there's a use for this dress reform. So women who just wanted to wear more comfortable clothing and not be trapped in corsets and and be um, dressed as if they were upholstery almost – um, but there wasn't a reason for it. And so once you have this bicycle, people are like, oh, well, yeah, they need to wear different clothing if they want this bicycle. And the fact that the bicycle was being um, uh, marketed and promoted as a tool to advance women's health. And so you get women like um, Mary uh, Mary Sergeant Hopkins, who went by the pen name The Mary Wheeler, and she eventually has this magazine called The Wheel Woman. She does. She goes on lecture tours, and she lectured here in Hartford about um, the health benefits of bicycle riding and getting outdoors in nature. And uh, she has this quote um, that, that it's far easier to convince a woman that she is suffering from some insidious disease than to make her believe that she only needs fresh air and outdoor exercise to improve her health. And of course, the bicycle can do that. So as society realized that the bicycle provides recreation as well as a sense of freedom and transportation, um, then adopting a new a new outfit, at least for that purpose. Women couldn't just like walk down the street in these bloomers without their bicycle next to them. That would have been seen as still would have been as scandalous as showing their ankle. But if they had that bicycle with them, then somehow it was okay. This is where we live. Eileen Frank is with the Connecticut Historical Society in Hartford. She's chief curator and COO there. Also uh, joining us by phone, Margaret Guroff, author of The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. Uh, Margaret, we were curious about, uh, we can hear how there's a shift in what women were wearing so that they were able to wear bicycles. But then how did that encourage independence and the women's rights movement? Um, Well, it's a pretty straight line. If I can jump back for one second, I just wanted to mention something because Eileen talked about dressing um, in a certain way for riding bikes and dressing in a different way um, on the street, which is absolutely true. Um, There's a a historian in England who has a uh, website called bikesandbloomers.com who has done a lot of research into convertible costumes. So women were, at the time, were um, expanding their, you know, they were very inventive. And one thing that they did was develop design uh, costumes that could, like, fold back or um, unzip or um, in some way change so that it would become a bicycle costume, but then it could go back to being something that was proper on the street. And this uh, researcher, Dr. Kat Jungnickel, actually has recreated some patterns. So if there's anyone listening who is curious about what these women were wearing and maybe wants to try making something, you can go on that website, bikesandbloomers.com, and actually find patterns of this exact kind of dress. We're going to be uh, crashing into our break soon. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that um, independence movement that began. Martha. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so uh, women, as we said before, were kind of restricted to their homes or where they could walk or where they could walk with a chaperone, a proper middle class Young women didn't go out alone. Um, When they get on the bicycles, not only can they go farther, but the need for a chaperone kind of falls away, uh, perhaps because uh, it was always acceptable for a young woman to go riding a horse by herself, and this was considered an extension of this, even though it was available to more people. It's also possible that it was because uh, chaperones tended to be old ladies, and they didn't necessarily know how to ride bikes or want to ride bikes. But so what you got was women um, going out on their own uh, with their friends, meeting up with each other, um, um, mingling with young men without any prying eyes. And um, they started talking about, uh, you know, what they wanted from life and what was holding them back. And one of the things that they wanted was the vote. And so some of these, uh, these women who felt newly empowered by bicycles began meeting together and talking about how to agitate for their suffrage. Meanwhile, uh, 
the bicycle era uh, started to get overshadowed by the introduction of the automobile. We just have a couple minutes before our, our break, but Eileen, can you talk about um, how did this shift uh, in the fact that the automobile was coming online, did that help more working class people get access to bicycles then? I mean, bicycles uh, definitely start becoming something that the working class can afford and can use, and and helps them with their with their transportation. They're they're still a very um, affordable form of transportation for for anyone up until today, and and sort of the same thing. When the first automobiles were coming out, they were. Um, they were experimental. They were incredibly expensive. Um, they had complications. They required special knowledge. So that was not a form of transportation that was going to be um, economical for anyone who wasn't of the uh, complete upper echelons of society. Um, and so the bike just kept coming down in price. But it's still it's still a luxury item. You still have to have that disposable income to to afford that bike. And um, and if you're a woman, you still have to have the income to change your outfit somewhat to, to go bike riding. So um, walking is still the cheapest form, but bicycles were definitely a help. Uh, we heard Margaret mention the suffrage movement. There was the quote from Susan B. Anthony, uh, I think the bicycle has done more to emancipate women than any one thing in the world. Uh, Margaret, uh, we're almost out of time, but if you could talk just about how uh, the bicycle helped change the perceptions that women were not weak Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, what it did, the perception that women were weak came in part from all these, this clothing, um, you know, very constrictive, very heavy. So you could stand up and you'd faint. And people just thought, well, if you're a refined lady, you faint a lot. And when they got on the bicycle, they started getting a little exercise, their clothing got, got looser. They, they began to recognize the value in exercise. They began to physically feel stronger, and they began to reject some of what their own doctors were telling them about how the only way not to faint is to lie down on a couch, you know? So, um, so the bicycle gave them evidence that, um, that they could be stronger than they knew. Margaret Guroff, again, is author of The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. She's going to stay with us, but I want to thank Eileen Frank, Chief Curator and COO of the Connecticut Historical Society. You can go to our website, wmpr.org slash where we live, for some of these great pictures from that era. Eileen, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we'll talk more about how bicycles are still a sign of empowerment. We're going to learn more about the BC Co. program in Hartford. But first, our fundraising campaign. If you appreciate the wide variety of topics, where we live tackles each week, including Connecticut history. Please support this program. Here are two of my colleagues to tell you how. Hi, I'm Carmen Baskoff here with Lydia Brown. And we're taking a quick moment to ask you to think about why you love public radio. If you're listening right now, you're probably a fan of local programming like Where We Live. Each week, we work hard to put together shows that connect you to the issues, events, and people in our state and our communities. If you appreciate this work, we hope you'll become a part of this community that's Connecticut Public Radio. You can make a pledge of support by going online to wnpr.org slash donate. That's wnpr.org slash donate. Thank you very much. And now back to where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we've been learning about bicycle history and how this type of transportation rose to prominence in the late 1800s, only to become overshadowed by the automobile. But bicycling is still an important way to get around for some Connecticut residents. A bike shop in Hartford has been working to help young people and adults to not just ride, but to also know how to repair their bikes. Now, why is this important? Joining us uh, for more about BC Co. is Joseph Dickerson. He's program manager at BC Co. at the Center for Latino Progress. Uh, Joseph, welcome to the show. Hi, New. Hi, thank Thanks very, very much for having me on. So tell us a little bit about BC Co. and its mission. Sure. Um, BC Co. is a program that's uh, the social enterprise for the Center for Latino Progress. And uh, it's a great program that's really focused on building a community around bikes. Um, it brings people together that love bikes, that uh, really care about developing the community of people that uh, ride, that enjoy um, using bikes as transportation, as tools for economic opportunity. Um, we really think that bikes are incredibly powerful and empowering. Um, I think a lot of your guests were pointing to the history of bikes uh, as tools for empowerment and economic opportunity. I think that, you know, that story is still ongoing today. And, um, you know, for Hartford, I think uh, we're, BC Co. is really focused on how do we create and perpetuate that story in a really positive, powerful, impactful way, Um, not just for folks that use bikes as recreation, but also folks that use 
Uh, bikes is their main form of transportation for work, for school, for their job. Uh, and then also making sure that individuals have the skill sets that they need to not just have a bike that uh, that they use that then breaks down and then they can't fix, but that they actually have the skills to be able to make sure that their bike is in good working order so that they're not skidding out into intersections or, you know, that they're able to ride safely and uh, use their bike consistently. I mentioned that uh, BC Co. Uh, works to uh, ensure that both youth and adults know about bicycle safety as well as being able to repair uh, your own bike. So tell us about the initiative um, that you started with young people in Hartford. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's one of our things that we love most uh, is, uh, you know, we we have a great group of young people that work at BC Co., um, we right now we have about four kids that are um, interns with us. They've been with us for some of them have been with us for nearly a year. Um, almost all of them have started out in our earn a bike program, um, and so our earn a bike program is really focused on teaching young people between the ages of twelve and nineteen, roughly um, about how the, all the ins and outs, ups and downs, top to bottom, front to back, how to maintain and build a bike. Um, the youth come in. We Our next class is actually starting uh, October 23rd, um, Tuesday, and they'll come in. It's an eight-week-long program, twice a week, where you really get into the nuts and bolts of how to repair a bike and how to put one together. And the youth will actually get a bike out of that program that they've built up, tuned up, and customized themselves. Uh, and then they'll also get access to our shop, and we also use that as really our way of introducing youth to our program so that we can ultimately, we want to be able to hire youth into our program as well. And so this is a really job development um, and workforce development program that uh, we think is really valuable for the kids that that work with us you know, uh, over the course of the year. Um, how do you break down gender barriers? Because when people think of bicycling, they may think that this is more of a, totally. a male activity. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, um, you know, go, kind of going to what your guests have been saying, um, you know, bikes have traditionally been seen as sort of this male, um, you know, male tool. And I think what's great is that, you know, bikes are really opportunities and access for everyone. And um, one of the things that we really think is important and that we prioritize at BC Co. is making sure that we create, you know, on our, for example, our Monday night uh, from 530 to 830, we have a specifically designated time that's only for folks that identify as ladies or as femme. And we think that space is really important for breaking down the barriers that traditionally build up in a bike shop as sort of a male-dominated space. And, you know, BC Coast still has, you know, we still have a lot of dudes that come into our shop. Uh, and I think that's still valuable to have a space where anyone can come and anyone feels welcome. Um, but we also see that it's really critical to have uh, a space that really helps break down. Like, you know, I, you know, some folks come in, they don't know, you know, it's been years since they've ridden. They don't know how to change a flat tire. Um, and that's a barrier that they haven't been willing to ask about. And can we create a space that feels safe for people to ask those questions that like maybe feel silly, but like, that's a question that matters for you to stay on your bike, to feel confident riding your bike by yourself or around the city. And if we can provide that access and that opportunity, then um, I think we've done a big part of our job to get more people riding. And that's what we want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. This is where we live. Uh, you're hearing Joseph Dickerson, program manager for BC Co. at the Center for Latino Progress in Hartford. Uh, we're learning about uh, the history of bicycles today, but also how bicycles are seen as a, a tool uh, uh, for empowerment. Uh, with us by phone is Margaret Guroff, author of The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. Uh, before I go back uh, to Margaret, uh, can we talk a little bit about um, our city streets here in Hartford yeah, sure. or <laughs> whether you're in Bridgeport or any yeah. other part of, yeah. of the state of Connecticut and, and how um, the way the road are uh, configured, how it is difficult at times yeah. to be riding a bicycle and mm -hmm. feeling safe mm -hmm. and how it um, you know, affects uh, low-income residents yep. who need to rely on a bicycle to get to their jobs or to school. Yeah. I think, you know, we, 
bikes have uh, at least you know at least my experience here in Connecticut. I've I've ridden a lot in Washington D.C. I rode a lot in Washington State. I you know spent a lot of time in Philadelphia. Um, you know, as a as a state and and as a city in Hartford, we've really prioritized vehicle traffic. We've really prioritized and thought about how do we get people in from you know suburbs to downtown. And those same pathways that we think about prioritizing for how do we get people in from the suburbs to downtown are also some of the best ways to think about how do we get bikes from one section of the city to another. Um, and right now, we don't. A lot of the infrastructure that we've put in place hasn't been optimized to think about how do we make uh, spaces that work for bikes, that are safe for bikes, that really encourage riders uh, to think more about riding and encourage cars to make space for bikes. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're starting to tick toward um, a society that really thinks more about bikes. Uh, we have, you know, we have a lot more people on bikes with line bike coming out, for example, that encourages, I think, just seeing more bikes, the more bikes that are on the road, the safer all bikers are um, because cars are more aware. And we're also able to think about how do we push, um, you know, political influencers to think more about prioritizing how they, uh, how the roads are developed and where monies are allocated for infrastructure around bikes. And so, I mean, I think, you know, for folks that are coming in from different sections of the city that uh, are lower income, you're really thinking about how do you get where you need to go with your bike. And um, like, for example, we have a Bikes for Job Access program that is prioritized and structured around folks that are coming from traditional programs, halfway houses, um, et cetera, that can be referred in by a counselor, payroll off uh, parole officer, uh, case manager, job counselor, et cetera, that they can get a bike for 20 bucks. They get a bike, a like, light lock and a helmet for $20. And um, it's a bike that we've refurbished and that we know is in really good, high quality working condition. Uh, and we think that, you know, if you've got a bike, you've got opportunity to go further, faster, and, um, you know, take maybe a job that rather than thinking about just having to take a job in Hartford, you can go all the way out to West Hartford or Farmington um, or West Farms to think about, yeah, this is where I want to be able to work. And so bikes continue to be a tool for economic uh, mobility and opportunity. You mentioned uh, the the Lime bikes that mm -hmm. we saw the city of Hartford uh, begin to make available. I think it's been a couple of months now or maybe yeah, more. Yeah, it started in April, I think. Yeah. Um, but are there disadvantages even to that system with uh, the type of bike that is available or even access to a smartphone to be able to <laughs> sign out or reserve yeah. the bike? Yeah, I think, you know, um, I think, you know, the, the concept behind the Lime bike is awesome. Having more people on bikes, I am never going to say that's a problem. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, dealing with access issues and, um, you know, trying to make sure that there's equal opportunity for access to these bikes is important. Um, the line bikes aren't particularly easy to ride. They're pretty big. They're pretty heavy. They've got three speeds. Uh, and so they're not exactly always the best for riding across town if you have a choice. Um, but, you know, the, the concept of having access to bikes, I think, is really powerful and vital for this city. Um, we're hoping, you know, as the, as the bike shop in Hartford, we're hoping that Lime Bikes are a tool or, you know, kind of, kind of that opening um, sort of gateway that gets people thinking, you know, this, having this bike and being able to get it, you know, somewhere around town has been good for me. Maybe I should think about getting my own bike and making an investment that would let me get on my own bike to, to get riding. Um, and something that would maybe be a little bit easier, a little bit faster, and that I know would be there when I come back out of my meeting or out of my job at 8 o'clock, you know, rather than have to go searching and playing Pokemon Go to find a line bike. Uh, so I think, you know, we're getting to a point where more people are thinking about if I have my own bike, I have my own means of transportation. And I have my own mean for um, for increased opportunity. I don't have to think about, do I have to pay a dollar today? Do I have to you know, find a bike right now? I'm going to turn uh, back to Margaret Guroff, author of The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. Uh, we hear in, especially in uh, cities, sometimes the, the fight for these uh, bicycling lanes uh, and how uh, people who are driving feel like these paved streets are, are more for them, Margaret. But this activism really exists because of cyclists in the first place. 
That is true. Um, when you're talking about uh, government financing of roads, that's something that the, the all-powerful bicycle lobby at the end of the 19th century helped to um, put into place. Uh, bicyclists wanted to be able to ride out of the city, out into the countryside. The roads at the time all over the country were horrible. They weren't paved, um, and they were maintained by the farmers who lived nearby. And it was a bicycle um, uniting of the bicyclists with farmers that actually pressured governments. And I believe the Connecticut state government may have been one of the first to, to start spending tax money on maintaining roads. So when I'm riding around on my bicycle on a city road and someone gives me a, you know, you don't belong on the road, I know I don't usually yell at them because that's dangerous. But I know in my heart that we were there first. Uh, when we look at the advocates for uh, bicyclists in certain communities, is it more the elites? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I want to be, like, generous to people in this conversation. And I think, you know, there is uh, – there's definitely, like, a perspective around recreational cyclists and, um, you know, sort of like – the middle-aged folks that you see riding around in Lycra all the time. Now, granted, I often happen to be a middle-aged person riding around in Lycra, Lycra quite, quite frequently. Um, and so there's definitely, I think, more, but there's an increasing level of awareness, I, I believe, in the bicycling community around the fact that, you know, if these roads are built better for everyone, they're also going to be built better for me. And I think the more that cyclists and the more that, you know, elites, you know, whoever start to think about collectively what makes for better roads that I want to ride on, that I want to be on, that I want to be a pedestrian on, that I want to have my kids walking around, that I want to have uh, my family out for a family gathering, a bike ride, the more that we all think of collectively about how do we do that. Um, the better off that our roads are going to be for everyone. Uh, Margaret mentioned this coalition uh, with farmers uh, back in the day. So when we uh, talk about uh, advocating for bicyclists, uh, the need for working with uh, different interest groups, uh, people from different backgrounds, and that not enough of that is happening today? Well, I think, you know, it's it's hard because, you know, we typically have these walls built up around sort of like this is, you know, I'm from Simsbury, I'm from West Hartford, I'm from Hartford, I'm from East Hartford. And, you know, I think that one of the initiatives at the Center for Latino Progress is Transport Hartford. And um, that's run by, you know, one of my um, good friends and, and co-workers, uh, Tony Shirolis. Mm -hmm. And Transport Hartford Academy, the whole focus around that program is to get people uh, breaking down the silos and to thinking more, how do we all join together to uh, work on the types of bikes and the types of programs that we want. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks to Joseph Dickerson, Program Manager for BC Co. at the Center for Latino Progress. Also thanks to Margaret Guroff. Her book's called The Mechanical Horse, How the Bicycle Reshaped American Life. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Our show is produced by Lydia Brown and Carmen Baskoff. Check out WMPR.org slash where we live for more about the show. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.